Being male comes with all kinds of social pressures to provide, protect, serve, die, and suffer, which differ drastically from the pressures that come with being female. Undeniably, this entails that there are meaningful disadvantages to being assigned male at birth that just don't come with being assigned female at birth. Here's the problem, though. When was the last time you heard a productive conversation about men's issues? And for me personally making this video, how the hell do I talk about this without sounding like an anti-feminist shit weasel from 2015? Part 1. Male Disadvantage If I'm going to talk about men's liberation, I'm going to have to go through the problems that come from the male gender role. War Men have fought most of history's wars. Even today, men in the U.S. are forced to register for the draft while women are not. Even though for a long time women were excluded from participating in combat, today, every position in the military that is available for men is available for women, but men are still expected to register for the draft well women aren't. Even the way we talk about war demonstrates that we consider the loss of women to be more notable or tragic than the loss of men. The New York Times has featured quotes like these, which imply that the loss of some healthy adult civilians are more notable than the loss of other healthy adult civilians. Prison Men are more likely to be arrested than women for similar crimes, face harsher pretrial treatment, and are given longer sentences for the same crimes. Even though men do commit the majority of crimes, these disparities don't make sense unless our legal system at least unconsciously considers men to be inherently more dangerous or violent than women. Life expectancy. Men have considerably shorter life expectancies than women do. In the US, women live about five years longer than men on average, and this difference is of course amplified when race is taken in consideration, with white women living more than 10 years longer than black men live on average. There are a lot of factors to consider why this is the case, and no one knows how much of it is biology and how much of it is social, but it is notable that the discrepancy between men's and women's life expectancies has widened in the last hundred years. Social factors like the following are likely to influence the discrepancy in life expectancy. Violence. Men are the majority of not only those who die in war, but also those who are murdered, 78% in the U.S. Suicide. Although women are more likely to attempt suicide, almost everywhere in the world, men are considerably more likely to kill themselves than women are. Workplace fatalities. Men make up over 92% of workplace fatalities, largely because they occupy the most dangerous jobs. Biological factors. It's really unclear how much of this is due to biological factors, though, such as men being physically larger than women, having different risks for heart disease and associated illnesses, but this is probably at least some of the discrepancy. Men's bodies. Male infants in the West are often routinely circumcised without anesthetic, which is both painful and avoidable. The difference in how we treat male circumcision compared to female genital mutilation is particularly striking. For example, back in 2010, in a Somali community in Seattle, many residents wanted to perform female genital mutilation on their female children, a traditional part of some Somali cultures, which involves the partial or entire removal of the clitoris, labia majori, and the labia minori, which has rightly been recognized as mutilation that does great harm to anyone subjected to it. To avoid members of the community either performing the procedure or sending girls to Somalia to have it done, a Seattle hospital agreed to perform a ritual nick of the clitoral pupus, drawing a small amount of blood but leaving no permanent change to the genitals. However, this small, non-permanent drawing of blood, which at least some members of the community thought satisfactory enough to avoid circumcising their female children, was widely condemned in the American media as medicalizing the mutilation of women, to quote the New York Times, and the Seattle compromise of the ritual nick was completely dropped from any medical institution. This means, as David Benatar says, that whereas the entire foreskin of a male infant may be removed without an anesthetic, the much milder procedure of merely drawing blood from the clitoral pupus has been rendered taboo. Men's families. We generally see men as less essential to childcare than women are. This has generally been seen as a disadvantage to women who bear the majority of childcare responsibilities, but in a lot of very real ways this hurts men. Men are much less likely to get custody of their children in divorce disputes than women are. One study from the US showed that in 90% of cases where women made an uncontested request for sole custody, they were granted it, but this figure was only 75% for men. These figures, however, can vary widely by state, and in some places the disparity is almost equal. 
Some academics say that in fact, accounting for all factors, men have the advantage in custody disputes, but in general, it is concluded that men are less likely to get custody than women, even when they're both seeking it. Male sexual assault. Women are sexually assaulted more than men. However, male victimization is taken less seriously. Take, for example, the study done in 1988 by Ronald E. Smith, Charles J. Pine, and Mark E. Hawley. In the study, male and female subjects were told they were in a study about legal decision-making and given the following scenario, which they were told was a real case. A hitchhiking 20-year-old college student is picked up by two people who later pull into a deserted field, pull a gun, and force the college student to disrobe and engage in oral sex. The assailants were later arrested and the gun found in their car. At the trial, the assailants acknowledged that the sexual activity happened, but claimed it was consensual. The subjects, however, were randomized to one of four versions of the scenario, which differed only in the names of the people involved. One with male assailants and a male victim, one with male assailants and a female victim, one with female assailants and a male victim, and one with female assailants and a female victim. Even though a majority of the subjects judged the assailants as guilty, male victims were said to have been more likely to encourage the sex acts, and victim stress was judged to be the least when victims were male and the assailants female. The subjects also recommended significantly longer sentences for male assailants than for female assailants. In some places, such as the United Kingdom, even the designation rape requires the perpetrator to penetrate the victim with a penis, and therefore women cannot rape men, and have to be charged with a different offense. Such codifications in our legal system represent how even those can consider men to be the main perpetrators of sexual assault and women the main victims. Part 2. Why? Many of these disadvantages of being male seem to come from our traditional gender constructs, in the same way many of the disadvantages of being female come from traditional gender constructs. Men are expected to bear mental health burdens alone, which may be the reason fewer men seek mental health treatment than women, and why the male suicide rate is much higher. Men are considered more sexual than women, so therefore women are given a greater right to privacy, and men are considered less likely to be sexually assaulted. Men are considered more dangerous than women, so are given custody of their children less often, and handed longer prison sentences with less leniency. Men are supposed to be protectors of women, so men are sent to war, and women are not. One hypothesis about the disadvantages of being male is Warren Farrell's hypothesis of male disposability, which argues that although men seem to have power in society, it's actually women who have the privilege of being protected by the disposable male underclass. This accounts for how men make up the majority of deaths in war, the majority of the homeless, and the majority of those murdered. Farrell's hypothesis, however, falls short in a few major ways. It doesn't account for disadvantages women face, such as higher rates of poverty due to the burden of childcare, and very seldom considers factors like choice. Take, for example, a section in his book which analyzes the practice of polygyny. Farrell argues that this historical practice served to protect women from poverty rather than advantage men. He says, Polygyny, then, was a system by which the rich man, by having more than one wife, prevented a woman from being stuck with a poor man. Polygyny was a form of socialism for the poor woman. The rich man was taxed to help the poor woman. This is considered an advantage for women, but Farrell never considers that perhaps women might prefer not to be part of a harem, even if that means being poor. He also never considers that rich men might have an interest other than social duty to have more than one wife. Clearly, choice is a more important factor than Farrell makes it out to be, and choice has typically been reserved for men, even though being male comes with other disadvantages. Male disposability as a hypothesis definitely has some truth, don't get me wrong. The male gender role does relegate men to being protector providers for women who are seen as weaker and more vulnerable. However, Farrell's analysis is somewhat weakened by his propensity to consider male and female differences to be a zero-sum game, meaning that all disadvantages to maleness grant advantages to femaleness. This is often not the case. Part 3. How do we fix this? I find Now, to go back to my original question, how the hell do you talk about this? Well, I'm going to show you a couple of ways that are not productive when talking about men's issues. First off, you have outrage stories about specific women or feminists doing awful things. You'll see this a lot on websites like A Voice for Men or r slash men's rights, which often just become places to talk about something a specific woman does and claim that she represents feminism. Here's the top post on r slash men's rights the week I made this. 
It's an article from Ben Shapiro's website, no less, about a woman who premeditated an attack with boiling water on her husband, burning 12% of his body, resulting in him needing to be hospitalized and have skin grafts. She was convicted for recklessly and intentionally causing serious injury in circumstances of gross violence, but ended up only serving 37 days in jail during pretrial sentencing. Her final sentence was a three-year community corrections order, meaning she served no further prison time. Now, this is a pretty outrageous story. Some woman attacks her husband and only gets a slap on the wrist. Horrible. A lot of other people on the internet agreed, and this article was featured in news across Australia, New Zealand, and even the United States. So this case was pretty shocking to me. So I looked into the laws about this type of assault and the mandatory non-parole sentence for someone convicted of causing serious injury in circumstances of gross violence is four years in Australia. She only got out of this because of her long record of mental health issues, including PTSD, major depression, which can exempt someone from these mandatory minimums. Now, I don't think someone who premeditated an attack on their husband like this should be out and about in society. It seems like the loophole about vague conditions like mental illness needs to be reformed in Australia. Okay, so what can we learn from this story? Well, bringing up these sentencing disparities between men and women seems productive, as well as bringing attention to how domestic abuse happens to men as well as women. But primarily this is a story about Australia's mental illness exemptions, right? I mean, this is a pretty big break in the norm from in assault cases like this. Now how do the folks at r slash men's rights respond to this? Toxic femininity. Another reason to stay single and not cohabitate with women. Watch out guys, all your wives can pour boiling water on you now. This would absolutely not be the case if the genders were reversed. It's actually really scary how 50% of the population in some jurisdictions know they're essentially immune from punishment for violent crime, or at least they'll be treated leniently. Does it make sense to say women are immune from violent crime repercussions? Well, no. The reason this case was so widely reported was because it was a violation of the norms set in Australia. Domestic abusers like this are supposed to face longer sentences in prison. Is this a reason to be afraid of women? No, again, it's still the case that more women are victims of domestic abuse than men. Sentencing disparities that occur when left to a judge's discretion are a systemic issue, but using this legal loophole to entirely avoid prison is not. Another wrong approach to men's rights frames men as the victim of women's empowerment. To see this, we'll look at PragerU. But increasingly, our schools have little patience for what only a couple of decades ago would have been described as boyishness. A psychologist, Michael Thompson, has aptly observed Girls' behavior is the gold standard in schools. Boys are treated like defective girls. Now, as a result, these defective girls are not faring well academically. Compared with girls, boys earn lower grades, they win fewer honors, they're far less likely to go to college. Boys are languishing academically while girls are prospering. In an ever more knowledge-based economy, this is not a recipe for a successful society. We need to start thinking about how we can make our grade school classrooms more boy-friendly. Ugh, these school teachers treat our sons like they're supposed to be girls. I mean, my son isn't a defective girl. Look at how big that representation of a girl gets compared to a boy. Christina Huff Summers is right in some ways. Boys are disadvantaged in school. Specifically, they face punishment more often and have generally been doing worse in school, especially at the lower end of the academic spectrum. However, the way this is framed is that schools have decided all of a sudden that girls are superior to boys, the gold standard, in fact. However, a lot of the problems Summers brings up in the video, like boys reading less, boys facing harsher punishments, and a lack of recess, really have nothing to do with recent changes in favor of girls. Boys reading less possibly has to do with, as Warren Farrell says in his book The Myth of Male Power, literature being considered unproductive to having a career and therefore feminine. Of course, Prager you might not want to bring this up because they're always encouraging men to have productive careers. Similarly, men and boys have always faced harsher punishments across Western civilization as we consider girls to be more delicate or vulnerable, something that, again, Prager you agrees with because it enforces traditional gender norms. Not having recess? How is this even gendered in favor of girls? A lack of recess seems to have more to do with increasing urbanization and changing safety requirements, not girls being considered the gold standard. 
So even though Summers makes valid points, she falls into Farrell's issue of framing this as a zero-sum, we're hurting boys to help girls debate, instead of recognizing that things like bringing back recess would just help both genders. So there are wrong ways to talk about men's issues, but sometimes that's not even what a lot of the discourse is about. Men's discontent doesn't just manifest into tackling issues, but instead into a vague feeling that feminism is somehow wrong. Anti-feminist YouTubers like Sargon of Akkad, She One Head, Armored Skeptic, Thunderfoot, Blair White, and Chris Reagan became immensely popular for making fun of feminists back on the internet between 2014 and 2017, some even to this day. However, I think it's pretty obvious when you think about it that anti-feminism does nothing to help most men. Nor does it claim to, it's just anti-something. Men's problems weren't caused by the advancement of women, and none of them will be fixed by rolling back these advancements. So, we can't be angry at women, or say that women are being advantaged so that men are disadvantaged, or even just complain about feminism. What is productive when talking about men's issues? Well, my favorite community for this is a place called r slash men's lib, which is a place for all different types of men to discuss their thoughts and feelings in a world which often discourages men from having these types of discussions. It's really amazing and helped me consider a lot of what it means to be a man and the unique challenges men face without some of the toxic attitudes in other men's communities. Or other organizations like NOMAS or the National Organization for Men Against Sexism fight for things like public rights, LGBTQ plus rights, and women's rights in a super positive and inclusive way. So there are individual communities and organizations that discuss men's rights in a positive way, but there really isn't a single movement which productively discusses men's issues. I mean, clearly we need some kind of social, political, and economic movement which addresses inequalities between men and women that come from entrenched social norms and legal barriers. Wait, that just sounds exactly like feminism. Can feminism address men's issues? Well, I think so, but a lot of other people, especially men, don't. Many men just don't feel included in feminist discourse, and honestly, I can see why. It's not hard to find women who, when complaining about their experiences with men, casually say things like, I hate men, or frame men as oppressors and women as the oppressed, when really gender disparities are much more complicated than that, and women aren't the only ones who are disadvantaged. So, women, feminists, us gals, we need to reflect on how gendered roles and discrimination don't just hurt women, but men too. More importantly though, we should reach out and listen to the many men who suffer under a gender role that has not gone through the same scrutiny as our own. And for the men out there, I suggest you band together, have a movement that's positive in the same way men's liberation movements are, as well as organizations like NOMAS. Because there are lots of women who are willing to listen and who will reach out and fight for gender equality with you. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed this video.